Dr. Lorraine Murphy is an associate professor of English at Hillsdale College, where she has taught for the past 10 years. A recipient of the Emily Darty Award for Teaching Excellence, she teaches courses in realism, the 18th century novel, and Jane Austen. She serves as faculty advisor to the Kravitz and Blue Stockings Regency Appreciation Club and as secretary for the Phi Kappa Phi Honor Society. She taught a Hillsdale College online course titled The Young Jane Austen, Northanger Abbey, which is available at online.hillsdale.edu. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Murphy. Thank you, Grace. And I'd also like to thank Doug Jeffrey and Matt Bell for inviting me to speak, and all of you for being here to listen. That her novels have been so repeatedly and successfully adapted to film tells us something of Austen's skill in scripting plot and character. But one thing a film cannot give you is the voice of the narrator. I'd like to open tonight with a passage from Emma that I believe reveals something essential about Austen's particular genius. Emma, in this passage, has accompanied her protege, Harriet, to the general store in Highbury. Harriet, tempted by everything and swayed by half a word, was always very long at a purchase. And while she was still hanging over muslins and changing her mind, Emma went to the door for amusement. Much could not be hoped from the traffic of even the busiest part of Highbury, Mr. Perry walking hastily by, Mr. William Cox letting himself in at the office door, Mr. Cole's carriage horses returning from exercise, or a stray letter boy on an obstinate mule were the liveliest objects she could presume to expect. And when her eyes fell only on the butcher with his tray, a tidy old woman traveling homewards from shop with her full basket, two curs quirling over a dirty bone, and a string of dawdling children round the baker's little bow window eyeing the gingerbread, she knew she had no reason to complain and was amused enough, quite enough still to stand at the door. A mind lively and at ease can do with seeing nothing and can see nothing that does not answer. This, I suggest, is the secret to Austin's art. Gratefully secure in a mundane setting where others might see nothing of interest, Jane Austen could do with seeing nothing. Her lively mind could discern and articulate the meaning in a series of commonplace actions that would not answer to a more callous observer. By addressing her attention to an ordinary scene such as this, Austen gives it a voice. The most everyday materials are rendered eloquent by her precise and affectionate language. It's my privilege this evening to talk about Austen's life with the aim of understanding how it nurtured her talent. And my thesis is this, that her life and work were fueled by a passionate, or in the words of G.K. Chesterton, an exuberant interest in the ordinary. Jane Austen's natural exuberance is enriched over the course of her life by a network of love and friendship that brings her into contact with every variety of anticipation, disappointment, uncertainty, loss, hope, laughter, and joy we can know. Perhaps her natural reserve with strangers, as well as the unpredictable nature of some relationships, encouraged that close scrutiny of the minutia of our social behavior that is a hallmark of her fiction and a large part of what makes it so filmable. Her exuberant spirit is somewhat chastened by a prolonged period of hardship and the awareness of her dependent position in society. Yet the sense of joyful possibility remains from first to last, ever expressed in her work with a Mozartian fluency in the resources of the English language. She is unfailingly precise and funny and real. She was born December, excuse me, December 7, 16th, 1775, seventh of her parents' eight children. 
The Austins were not financially prosperous, but they were hardworking, energetic, and busy, and theirs was a home where the written word was celebrated. Jane's father, the Reverend George Austin, served as rector of the Church of St. Nicholas, seen here, in the small village of Steventon, county of Hampshire, southwest of London. Here you see the church door framed by carvings, not of saints or angels, but of a man's face and a woman's. Reverend Austin farmed in his spare time, ran a boy's boarding school out of their crowded home, seen here, and collected a library of some 500 volumes that Jane was free to borrow from as she pleased. His wife, Cassandra, in addition to her duties as mother, schoolmistress, head gardener, and manager of the dairy and poultry yards, still found time to write witty poems for special occasions, and Jane's older brothers published a periodical and supervised the staging of plays when family and friends gathered at their parsonage for the holidays. The children would have no inheritance to speak of from their parents. Indeed, Reverend Austin and his wife spent several years digging their way out of debt on a very small income. Their eldest son, James, took a degree at Oxford and became a clergyman, inheriting his father's post at Steventon when he retired. The next son, George, suffered an unspecified disability, perhaps a seizure disorder or perhaps cerebral palsy. But he lived a long and otherwise healthy life in the care of a family in a neighboring village. The third brother, Edward, was adopted at the age of 12 by distant relations who were very wealthy and childless. He remained close with his parents and siblings and came to play a pivotal role in Jane's life, but financially and socially, his adoption removed him to another sphere. Henry was the most gregarious Austin and followed several professions, including army officer, banker, and clergyman in the course of his interesting life. Francis and Charles, the two youngest boys, pursued careers in the Navy, Francis rising to the rank of admiral. Finally, little Cassandra was like a second mother to her younger sister, Jane. Mrs. Austin remarked, if Cassandra's head had been going to be cut off, Jane would have hers cut off too. <laughs> Jane's formal schooling was brief, and perhaps blessedly so, as girls' schools could be a breeding ground for infections that were too often fatal. She made a narrow escape from a serious illness after being sent away to school at the age of seven. Returned safely home, she mastered needlework, which was a vital part of her contribution to the household economy and enjoyed piano. Cassandra studied drawing. Her father must have encouraged Jane to enjoy his library, and her brothers must have brought new publications home on a regular basis, for by the time she began writing fiction, at 12 or 13, she was familiar with the classics of the earlier 18th century, the essays of Samuel Johnson and the novels of Samuel Richardson, as well as more contemporary novels by Charlotte Lennox, Fanny Burney, Mariah Edgeworth, and Anne Radcliffe. Three leather-bound notebooks were her first prized possessions. The second is inscribed, A Gift from My Father, and the third is inscribed in the hand of Reverend Austin himself, who praises his daughter's stories as effusions of fancy by a very young lady consisting of tales in a style entirely new. One of the longer stories in the second notebook is dated June 1790, when Jane was 14. Her first notebook was by then already full. Her practice was to draft on scrap paper and then transcribe her stories into the notebooks when she considered them ready, so to speak, for publication. Individual stories were dedicated to various friends and family members, and the notebooks were passed around in the Austin Circle in the manner of published books. It sounds very serious, and it is, but the stories themselves are full of hilarity. Young Jane delights in satire, and in particular, she enjoys sending up the emotional excess that was characteristic of popular fiction at the time 
in a story in the epistolary style, composed as a series of letters that Jane wrote at 14, she gives us the following with her protagonist, Laura, writing to a younger woman, Marianne. Convinced as you must be from what I have already told you concerning Augustus and Sophia, that there never were a happier couple, I need not, I imagine, inform you that their union had been contrary to the inclinations of their cruel and mercenary parents, who had vainly endeavored with obstinate perseverance to force them into a marriage with those whom they had ever abhorred. But with an heroic fortitude worthy to be related and admired, they had both constantly refused to submit to such despotic power. <laughs> After having so nobly disentangled themselves from the shackles of parental authority by a clandestine marriage, they were determined never to forfeit the good opinion they had gained in the world in so doing by accepting any proposals of reconciliation that might be offered them by their fathers. To this farther trial of their noble independence, however, they were never exposed. <laughs> she further displays her mastery of satire in the history of England by a partial prejudiced and ignorant historian in which she imitates the dry narration of Gibbon and Goldsmith and includes a running joke on her fidelity to Mary, Queen of Scots. Here she gives us the reign of Edward VI, son of Henry VIII. As this prince was only nine years old at the time of his father's death, he was considered by many people as too young to govern. And the late king happening to be of the same opinion, his mother's brother, the Duke of Somerset, was chosen protector of the realm during his minority. The Duke was beheaded, of which he might with reason have been proud, had he known that such was the death of Mary, Queen of Scotland. <laughs> but as it was impossible that he should be conscious of what had never happened, it does not appear that he felt particularly delighted with the manner of it. <laughs> the use of humor to probe the darker side of human behavior from a safe distance is perfected in a complete novella Austin wrote, probably in 1794, when she would have been 18 years old, titled Lady Susan. It's in the epistolary form and features a smart, manipulative, almost amoral protagonist, a widow and mother who uses charm and a thorough mastery of social conventions to get on in the world, cheerfully disrupting and privately laughing at the dull but well-meaning people who come in her way. This is the story which Stillman adapted as Love and Friendship, the film we're screening tomorrow, and, and I can assure you that it's something very delightful. The story's power derives from the charisma of Lady Susan herself, but also from the exposure of mannered behavior as a resource that, while ostensibly designed to convey respect and deference, can be deployed for completely self-serving ends. And this, I think, is an insight that propels Jane Austen into the world of her mature fiction. The very next year, 1795, she began to draft the novel that would, many years later, become her first published work, Sense and Sensibility. Then titled Eleanor and Marianne, it's a study, among other things, of the value of suppressing emotion out of consideration for others. Eleanor Dashwood is the opposite of Lady Susan in every respect but one, that her demeanor does not reflect her true thoughts and feelings. When we step into society, we step into a role, as Eleanor knows too well. And Marianne, who can be nothing but natural and sincere, suffers greatly in London, where Willoughby is free to politely rebuff her. In Ang Lee's film, we rejoice that Colonel Brandon will protect Marianne from that knowledge of the world that might render her more mature, but less unspoilt. It's a story of two sisters in love, and for a brief time, Jane and Cassandra knew that happiness. In 1795, Cassandra had been engaged to Tom Fowle, a young clergyman with very little income, for three years. That autumn, Tom agreed to sail to the West Indies as chaplain for a regiment of the British militia. Upon his return, they would marry. In 
Cassandra spent that Christmas holiday with the Fowl family in Berkshire to see Tom off, and the visit is the occasion for our first surviving letter from Jane to her sister, dated January 1796, when Jane was just 20. With a satiric humor that hardly disguises a sense of joyful anticipation, Jane refers to a young man named Tom Lefroy, an Irish cousin of neighbors with whom the Austins were friendly. He's visiting Hampshire on his way to London, and Jane confesses that she's danced with him repeatedly, that Tom is being teased about his attachment to her, and that she greatly enjoys his company. I'm almost afraid to tell you how my Irish friend and I behaved, she writes. Imagine to yourself everything most profligate and shocking in the way of dancing and sitting down together. <clears throat> it's appropriate to pause here and say a word about Austin's letters. She wrote them to scores of friends and relations, but in particular, when she and Cassandra were separated, Jane wrote copiously and often. In a stream of consciousness style, she records neighborhood news, visits given and received, the appearance or dress of this or that person, the quality of a meal. And she often works out the cutting side of her wit as if seizing an outlet for honest thoughts impossible to express in company. In that sense, a picture of her character drawn exclusively from her letters would be woefully incomplete. It's clear that Cassandra burned precisely the more personal missives to protect her sister's privacy. Claire Tomlin, whose biography of Austin I highly recommend, remarks of this letter to Cassandra. The fact that the manuscript Eleanor and Marianne was lying completed somewhere in the house as she wrote, gives this first letter an added resonance. It is the only surviving letter in which Jane is clearly writing as the heroine of her own youthful story, living for herself the short period of power, excitement, and adventure that might come to a young woman when she was thinking of choosing a husband. Just for a brief time, she is enacting instead of imagining. We can't help knowing that her personal story will not go in the direction she is imagining in the letter. That, as it turned out, it was not Tom Lefroy or anyone like him who became her adventure, but the manuscript upstairs. Not marriage, but art. And in her art, she made this short period in a young woman's life carry such wit and human understanding as few writers have managed to cram into solemn volumes three times the size. 75 years later, Tom Lefroy told Austin's nephew that he fell in love with Jane then with a boyish love. But he was expected to study law and work for his family's advancement, and he could not afford to marry a woman who wouldn't bring him a penny. He later indeed became a judge and then Lord Chief Justice of Ireland, amply fulfilling his family's trust and expectation. So the relations with whom he was staying whisked him away and took care that he and Jane did not cross paths on his subsequent visits. She never saw him again. Cassandra's fiance died of a fever in Santo Domingo in the spring of 1797. And though she was still in her 20s, she never considered another marriage. Jane, on the other hand, did entertain that possibility, but will come to that in its place. How would Jane Austen have appeared to a potential suitor? The descriptions of young men and women in her novels are not terribly detailed. She focuses on height, the manner of movement, and the quality of expression that can be found in the eyes. We know that Cassandra was considered the prettier of the two sisters. Jane's brother Henry said that had Jane been any taller, she would have exceeded the middle height. Several relations describe her as either slender or spare. Her posture was upright, and her step was light and firm or quick and decisive. Her eyes were bright, and her cheeks were full of color. Notably, she is the only one of eight siblings, excepting her brother George, who never had a professional portrait of any kind taken. 
the only image that survives, that was taken from the life, is this sketch with some watercolor drawn by her sister, Cassandra, seen here. Though Austin's niece, Anna, with whom she was close, later declared that this portrait was hideously unlike her Aunt Jane. <laughs> so she remains a bit of a mystery, and fittingly, we meet her in her language rather than any image. In the summer of 1796, Reverend Austin made a decision, the first of two that would have momentous consequences for his daughter Jane. Well clear of debt, and with their sons embarked on their respective careers, he and his wife would cease taking boarders and running their home as a boys' school. This meant that the burden of cooking, serving, and cleaning was greatly lessened for the women of the, of the house, and that Jane had more leisure to write. That autumn, she began drafting First Impressions, the work later renamed Pride and Prejudice. Within a year, she had polished that to satisfaction and took up Eleanor and Marianne, revising from the epistolary style to third-person narration. And I think this effort shows the sense of a vocation and something much more than uh, the desire to simply write for the amusement of herself or her family. In 1798 and 99, she wrote the novel later published as Northinger Abbey, then titled Susan. And in November 1797, Jane's father, possibly without her knowledge, sent a letter to one Thomas Cadell, a publisher in London, whose firm had printed the works of Gibbon and Johnson. Reverend Austin wrote that he had a manuscript for a novel in his possession, and would Mr. Cadell consider bringing it out at the author's expense? The publisher opened the letter, wrote, declined by return of post across the top, and mailed it back. The fact that Austin's father was one of her most ardent admirers makes it all the more poignant that his well-deserved retirement from the parish of Steventon brought Jane's writing life to a decisive halt. This second and equally momentous decision was announced to Jane and Cassandra over the Christmas holidays of 1800. By January 1801, plans to move to Bath were underway. Jane's piano was now sold. Her father's library was sold off too. Her parents intended to enjoy the crowded social calendar, theater, dances, card parties, commonly regarded as one of the prime attractions of Bath, and to take various forays to seaside resorts. Jane and her parents removed to temporary lodgings that spring while Cassandra made a visit with friends before joining them. And Jane's letters from this time reflect a struggle with low spirits. Another stupid party last night, she wrote. One card table with six people to look over and talk nonsense to each other. Regarding their search for a home, when you arrive, we will at least have the pleasure of examining some of these putrefying houses again. They are so very desirable in size and situation that there is some satisfaction in spending 10 minutes within. And the note of dejection is unmistakable. I cannot, anyhow, continue to find people agreeable. This from a woman who could make a cramped setting, or a trivial card game, or a disagreeable person bristle with interest on the page. In her writing desk were manuscripts for three complete novels, but her words now dried up. That Jane was tempted by a marriage proposal in 1802 may reflect both her unhappiness in Bath and her sense that her period of creative fruitfulness was at an end. Harris Bigwither was the younger brother of three sisters who were close, lifelong friends to Jane and Cassandra. He was five years Jane's junior when he proposed to her just shortly before her 27th birthday while she was visiting for the holidays. Harris was the only son and heir to his father's considerable estates, and as he would be wealthy in his own right, there was no need for any dowry on her side. Jane accepted his proposal, and the family celebrated the good news. But by early next morning, she had packed her bags 
and asked to see Harris again. We can't know what passed between them other than that she withdrew her acceptance and made arrangements to leave immediately. Did she determine that she could not be happy in the absence of romantic love? Did she fear the risks associated with bringing children into the world? Was she unable to face the prospect of giving up her writing for good? We can only speculate on the basis of those of her heroines who turned down offers of marriage. Elizabeth Bennet, who will not marry Mr. Collins because in the absence of deep respect and affection, they will not make one another happy. Fanny Price, who turns down Henry Crawford because she doubts his integrity of character. And Anne Elliott, who refuses Charles Musgrove because her heart still belongs to another man. In January of 1805, the Reverend Austin died peacefully in Bath. For four years, Jane had carried her manuscripts from place to place, packed in her writing desk. As far as we know, she had attempted only one fragment of a composition, never pursued. True, in 1803, she had achieved what might be called her first professional success by selling the manuscript of Northanger Abbey to the publisher Richard Crosby for 10 pounds, something like $400 in our currency. But as Crosby never printed her work, this was a somewhat discouraging success as first successes go. And now the Austin women, Jane, Cassandra, and their mother, were effectively homeless. They must forfeit the annuity Reverend Austin had earned as part of his retirement. They would live on whatever Jane's brothers together could provide them with the interest that Mrs. Austin and Cassandra earned on some small investments. Jane had none. They sometimes stayed near relations in Bath, but only in rented lodgings. They sometimes stayed with friends in Hampshire, and sometimes with Jane's brother Edward at his large estate in Kent, seen here. But they never stayed any one place very long, and they were always visitors or guests. This continued for another four years, making a gap of eight years in the career of a young woman who began to write at 12 or 14 and died at 41. Finally, in 1809, Edward Austin, owner of a great deal of land and property, this estate and others, realized there were houses at his disposal and that his mother and sisters might like to stay in one. <laughs> they chose a rather large brick home situated at a crossroads in Chawton Village in Hampshire. They had a garden to work at the back. Mrs. Austin was a devoted gardener. And they spent time making clothes and giving reading lessons to some of the needier children in the village. Jane's life was effectively transformed. The women agreed that Jane would prepare the family breakfast of tea and toast. She was typically the first to rise. But thereafter, the cooking, gardening, and general housework would be overseen by her sister and mother. And in moments of leisure, Jane could write. She began immediately, took the manuscripts out of her writing desk, and set to revision. Her lively mind, set at ease by the security of a settled home, could once again do with seeing nothing. And this ordinary nothing, the nothing special of a daily routine that had been so long denied her, could once again answer her attentiveness with the voice of inspiration. In 1810, she sold Sense and Sensibility and saw her first work in print the following year, a commercial success. The achievement must have been all the sweeter given how long she had waited. And from our perspective, it's made bittersweet by the fact that Austin would enjoy the full exercise of her powers for only five more years. But as an exuberant and energetic writer, she made them count. With one commercial success to her name, her publisher, Thomas Egerton, was happy to purchase the copyright to Pride and Prejudice in November of 1812. Jane describes lopping and cropping her 1797 manuscript into the form so beloved by all her admirers. Elizabeth Bennett never fails to charm us with her intelligence, self-assurance, and sense of humor. And Fitzwilliam Darcy is a man of reserve whose warm and devoted nature is gradually revealed. 
The drama turns on that moment when Elizabeth, overly trusting of her first impressions, is forced to revise her estimation of Wickham, of Darcy, and most especially of herself. But alongside that plot line runs another and related one that is, I think, easy to overlook. And in fact, our 1940 film version of the, of the novel uh, elides this. Though she's enlightened regarding Wickham's true history with the Darcy family, there are still depths to Mr. Darcy's character that Elizabeth has not yet plumbed. And so she still faces, as we all must, a moment of decision, of faith. And it is her instinctive, almost unthinking willingness in the novel to trust Mr. Darcy with her sister's humiliating story that actually allows him to rescue Lydia and the Bennett family's, the Bennett family's reputation. Jane spent the next two years drafting her most ambitious work yet, Mansfield Park. It is the work most provocative of differences among her fans, and I've not yet seen a film that I believe does it justice. Its heroine is Fanny Price, one of nine siblings born to overwhelmed and far from prosperous parents. But her mother's sister has married a baronet, and the Bertram family offered to adopt Fanny as a way of helping out. She grows into womanhood in outwardly comfortable circumstances, but remains painfully shy, physically weak, and of a somewhat secondary status among the Bertrams. Edmund, the kindest of her cousins, is her only friend apart from her brother William, with whom she corresponds devotedly. These illustrations from a late Victorian edition might give you a sense of Fanny's somewhat passive demeanor. The settled way of life at Mansfield Park is pleasantly unsettled by the arrival in their neighborhood of Henry and Mary Crawford, a brother and sister raised in London. Mary Crawford, something of a cross between Elizabeth Bennet and Lady Susan. Henry Crawford, a flirt who may charm the reader, but cannot succeed in charming Fanny. He hatches a plan to make her fall in love with him and is appropriately punished by falling in love with her himself and by surprising both himself and the reader with his potential for transformation. Cassandra begged Jane to let Henry win Fanny's hand in marriage, but she had other plans and Fanny marries her own secret love, cousin Edmund. Mansfield Park features searching debates on the morality of acting, the value of formal prayer, and the settled versus the mobile way of life. But I think its most remarkable feature is that Austen sustains our interest in a heroine who, unlike every young woman she'd previously scripted, almost never speaks. I wonder sometimes if Fanny's silence in the face of people and events that swirl around her, constant reminders of her dependence, reflects something of what Austen herself experienced during eight years when she seldom held a pen in her hands. Mansfield Park was published in 1814, a year after Pride and Prejudice. As if conscious that it would not be so well liked, Austen kept a bemused record of the opinions expressed by friends and relations. Her professional success was increasingly known in her family circle, but was by no means universal knowledge among her acquaintance. Of Mansfield Park, she notes, Mr. Egerton, the publisher, praised it for its morality and for being so equal a composition, no weak parts. Meanwhile, a Hampshire neighbor must have unwittingly confessed that she thought Sense and Sensibility and Pride and Prejudice downright nonsense, but expected to like Mansfield Park better, and having finished the first volume, flattered herself she had got through the worst. Between 1814 and 1815, Austen drafted Emma, perhaps her single greatest masterpiece, written at the height of her powers and again from the security of settled life in Chawton. A superficial acquaintance with Austen's canon detects the sameness of the courtship-driven plot. But even a cursory reading of Emma next to its predecessor, Mansfield Park, 
or its successor persuasion, reveals the exuberance with which Austin relished a new challenge. Emma is everything Fanny Price is not. As you can see here, she's more often in motion. Uh, she's born to wealth and power. She's talkative and extroverted. She's admired by many, including herself. Like Elizabeth Bennet, she's a confident young woman who must confront her own errors. But Emma's education unfolds in a series of revelations that are drawn out through a highly intricate plot. And she's also distinct in that through the masterful manipulation of point of view, her overconfidence is exposed to us from the start. This is what generates the delightful humor of her story. If Elizabeth is written as something like a friend to the reader, Emma is a beloved niece, one whose progress we chart with bemused affection from a stance of greater experience. If we look on Emma's progress from the vantage point of more mature knowledge, Austin herself was growing into the role of loving advisor to her nephews and nieces. She cautioned her niece Fanny not to be overly charmed by charisma or wit in a suitor, but to study private character. She encouraged her niece Anna, an aspiring writer, to value precision over flair and to be content with a narrow focus, to find the drama in a modest setting, and to avoid phrases like vortex of dissipation. <laughs> By early 1816, when Emma was published, Austen was herself composing a drama in which modesty and patience are the central virtues. In its opening chapters, Austen describes the chastened mindset of her aging heroine, and Eliot is 27 and verging on confirmed spinsterhood. She had been forced into prudence in her youth. She learned romance as she grew older, the natural sequel to an unnatural beginning. In her personal copy of the novel, Cassandra wrote in the margin, Dear, dear Jane, this deserves to be written in letters of gold as if these words hold a special key to Jane Austen's mind and heart. And I think the notion of learning romance is the reason. The belief that happy endings emerge from the quality of attention we bestow on outwardly undramatic people, as well as commonplace moments and settings, is an insight that explains the lasting power and lasting relevance of Austen's fiction. Originally titled The Elliots and published as Persuasion, this last finished work is shorter than Austen's earlier novels and in some ways more muted in tone. She was beginning to feel unwell. She had the disposable income to buy back the manuscript for Northanger Abbey from Crosby's publishing house, but she made only minimal revisions and set it aside, perhaps a sign of her diminished energy. In May, she visited a spa for refreshment, May of 1816, that is, and later that summer, entertaining house guests while Cassandra was away, expressed with a sense of wistfulness that composition seems to me impossible with a head full of joints of mutton and doses of rhubarb. She must have been thinking of Sanditon, a story set in an up-and-coming resort town that appears to be, among other things, a satire on those who frequent spas and suffer from imaginary illness. Sickness is a dangerous indulgence at my time of life, she wrote with a chin-up attitude to her niece Fanny. Nevertheless, she was too unwell to draft more than 12 chapters of Sanditon. Austin's niece, Caroline, later described a touching scene from around this time. Aunt Jane used often to lie down after dinner. My grandmother herself was frequently on the sofa, sometimes in the afternoon, sometimes in the evening, at no fixed period of the day. She had not bad health for her age, and she worked often for hours in the garden and naturally wanted rest afterwards. There was only one sofa in the room, and Aunt Jane laid upon three chairs which she arranged for herself. I think she had a pillow, but it never looked comfortable. She called it her sofa, 
and even when the other was unoccupied, she never took it. I often asked her how she could like the chairs best, and I suppose I worried her into telling me the reason of her choice, which was that if she ever used the sofa, Grandmama would be leaving it for her and would not lie down, as she did now, whenever she felt inclined. I can never decide if this reflects an excess of good manners or a sense of distance between mother and daughter, or perhaps those are two sides of a single coin. As it happened, as spring advanced, Jane's letters confess that she's increasingly confined to bed. She suffers fevers, back pain, and a growing fatigue. After periods of seeming convalescence, she would experience bouts of pain that belied the notion of progress. What was her illness? For many years, the suggestion was Addison's disease, which is a tuberculosis of the adrenal glands. But a more recent hypothesis points to some form of lymphoma. We'll never be sure. The letters from March and April of 1817 brim with gratitude for the devoted care of her family and the buoyant expectation of improvement. It's interesting to wonder if, in this attitude, Austin was consciously crafting a fiction for her first and last audience, her family circle. For in April, unbeknownst even to Cassandra, she drew up an unwitnessed will. A month later, the sisters took lodgings in Winchester to consult an experienced physician there. By June, Jane was apparently too weak to take up her pen at all. But words were her connection with life. On July 15th, she dictated to Cassandra a poem of 24 lines on the subject of the annual Winchester horse races. Remarkable how she continued to turn her attention outward to the life around her. And early on the morning of July 18th, she died with her head in Cassandra's lap. Her last surviving letter to a nephew concludes with a poignant reflection of what this keen observer saw and felt when she turned her eyes on herself. God bless you, my dear Edward. If ever you are ill, may you be as tenderly nursed as I have been. May the same blessed alleviations of anxious, sympathizing friends be yours. And may you possess, as I dare say you will, the greatest blessing of all in the consciousness of not being unworthy of their love. I could not feel this. Your very affectionate aunt, J.A. She was buried in Winchester Cathedral, the place marked with a black marble plaque and an inscription that cites the extraordinary endowments of her mind as just one of many virtues. With Cassandra's help, Henry composed a brief biographical notice for their sister and arranged for Northanger Abbey to be published with persuasion by the end of the year. The pairing is odd, but also apt. Persuasion, her last completed novel, and featuring a heroine subdued by painful experience, alongside Northanger Abbey, scarcely touched since Austin had drafted it 20 years earlier, with her most naive heroine, and certainly her most ebullient narrator. The comparison shows us that Austin never wrote half-heartedly, never wrote with less than mastery of her craft, and never stopped changing and growing. Fifty years later, the nephew to whom Austin addressed her last letter, James Edward Austin Lee, would compose a more detailed memoir, which seems to have catalyzed interest in her work. Both sales and critical commentary were modest before the turn of the century. Her popularity with ordinary readers, as opposed to fellow novelists, was boosted by the emergence of paperback editions in the mid-20th century. And since then, she has proved herself worthy of a very rare honor, an assured place in the canon of great books in the Academy, and the lasting devotion of those who read only for pleasure. In the words of Northanger Abbey, and what are you reading, miss? Oh, it is only a novel, replies the young lady, while she lays down her book with affected indifference or momentary shame. It is only Cecilia or Camilla or Belinda, or in short, only some work 
in which the greatest powers of the mind are displayed, in which the most thorough knowledge of human nature, the happiest delineation of its varieties, the liveliest effusions of wit and humor are conveyed to the world in the best chosen language. Given her current fame, another adaptation of Sense and Sensibility or Emma might seem ordinary, nothing special. What are your plans this evening, you might be asked. Oh, I'm only attending the Jane Austen CCA. <laughs> I'm confident, however, that those of us who take a closer look will continue to prize a quiet exuberance that belongs to only Jane Austen. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Murphy. We now have time for some Q&A. If you have a question, please make your way to one of the microphones in the aisle. Hi, Dr. Murphy. Um, I was just curious if we have access to the original draft of Eleanor and Marianne, and if we see any significant differences between that draft and Sense and Sensibility, which was written after all of her heartache. We do not have access to that first draft, and um, I believe it's on the basis mainly of internal evidence in the finished Sense and Sensibility, although I think also from one or two me brief remarks in her letters that we are pretty confident it was originally in the epistolary style and then revised. But we do not have that draft. The only, um, of her published novels, her finished novels, uh, the only manuscript that survives is, um, interestingly, uh, the concluding two chapters of Persuasion, uh, which she canceled and rewrote. So what we have is what she threw out, and it's, it's quite interesting to see what she wrote the first time, but uh, of her finished work, that's, that's the only manuscript in her hand that survives. All right, so uh, in recent years, some uh, criticisms of the economist Adam Smith have been that when he wrote Wealth of Nations, he had this maidservant who's really taking care of him the entire time. So of course he's gonna write this incredible economic theory about capitalism because well, he doesn't have to do anything. Uh, at least reflecting on the quote, like a mind li lively and at ease can do with seeing nothing. Could you see future literary criticisms of Jane Austen appearing basically because, as you said, in the, when she was at the peak of her powers, she was allowed to write the entire day, and it didn't really seem to be that there was much of a you know, struggle or intersectional narrative being applied towards her life at that time. Um, if I understand your question, is it's concerning future novelists or concerning Austen herself? So concerning Austen herself, could you see people criticizing her currently or in the future because when she was writing, that was kind of all she had to do. Like, of course she's gonna produce all these works, but was there any real struggle involved at that time? She, um, you see that critique of her work sometimes, of her fiction, where uh, you have a way of life, you know, Mrs. Bennet Bosa, her, her daughters have nothing to do in the kitchen, um, that that's all taken care of. Um, when Austin and her sister and mother lived at Chotton Cottage, they did have some help in the kitchen, but that did not mean that they were uninvolved. Um, but I think that, I mean, Jane Austen grew up in a family where she was accustomed to working and making a contribution. Everyone with an able pair of hands was accustomed to working and making a contribution. And uh, she and her sister and mother worked something out where, uh, they sort of agreed to shoulder a burden um, with a loving sense of, of what Jane, um, of Jane's vocation. So uh, she certainly was not distant from the reality of labor and the way that labor supports leisure and creativity. Uh, she actually befriended, actually in her will, she left everything to Cassandra except uh, 50 pounds to her brother Henry whose bank had failed and 50 pounds to a servant of a sister-in-law for whom she had a friendship. Now, she maintained um, an ongoing correspondence, a very friendly correspondence with uh, the woman who was the governess at her brother Edward's home in Kent. Um, so she seems to have had a, a, gr a great sympathy for working women, and I think she was 
um, kind of closer to that reality than we realize if we only read her, her published work. I know you said that uh, there weren't any satisfactory versions of Mansfield Park on film. I'm curious, why do you think that is? Is there something about it that's difficult to adapt or? I think so, um, and I should have, one thing about Austin that is very easy to adapt is her, her dialogue. She writes wonderful dialogue, and she has a wonderful ear for voice and for those little inflections of, uh, and mannerisms of, of speech that give such a lively sense of character. So in a lot of film adaptations, you'll find the dialogue almost word for word, what you'll find in the novels. Um, but as I said, Fanny Price almost never speaks. And it's difficult, I think, on film, uh, not impossible, certainly, but I think it's difficult to give a sense of the drama going on in the mind um, with so little being said. And, and so in some ways, um, the liveliest adaptation of Mansfield Park that I've seen makes of uh, Fanny Price a, a, an entirely different character. And the movie makers seem to have uh, sort of decided to replace Fanny Price with a picture of the young Jane Austen, which is interesting, but it's not Fanny Price. So her silence and her um, kind of passivity, her weakness, uh, even when she's pushed or pressed, she often doesn't wish to respond. And even for readers of the novel, that can feel frustrating. So translating that to film is maybe especially frustrating. You. You're welcome. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I was just wondering how common was it at that time for women to be authors and what kind of obstacles does that present to Austin in her career? It was, I don't know if you would call it common, but common enough that Austin was familiar with the published work, certainly of other female novelists. Uh, the obstacle was leisure. So even if Austin had, let's say, married Harris Bigwither and become quite a wealthy woman living a comfortable life, her duties as the head of the household would probably have prevented her from having that time to sit down and draft and revise. Um, uh, women often didn't publish under their own names, so none of Austin's works was published in her lifetime under her name. Um, but that didn't mean that women weren't interested in professional success and, and uh, and the independence that that could provide. So there were models, but they were not many. And as you could see, Austin had to sort of forge a way of life that would support her work. Uh, and that was sometimes difficult to do. Um, in previous lectures, it had been said that um, Jane Austen didn't necessarily write, um, sorry, she took, when she was writing her novels, she took for granted her social class and that um, the novels weren't necessarily to like depict that. Would, would you say that that is an accurate description of how she wrote in regards to social class, especially considering the fact that um, at least it seems like in her younger years and then um, after her father's death, her social status wasn't necessarily secure? I think that she took the class system, if, if we want to call it that, um, for granted, as has, has been said a couple of times. Um, and I, I don't think she was setting out to reform it um, or to question it um, in any kind of radical way. Um, her own life was, and this is not often, I think sometimes easy to overlook, she wrote about um, uh, a social uh, way of life that was a degree or two above her own. And uh, it's a way of life she would have been familiar with, for example, at her brother Edward's home, and, or at Harris Bigwither's home. Or, uh, she moved in a circle where this way of life could be known to her and could become familiar to her, but it wasn't her way of life. Um, and I think that in, in, she chooses not to make that a central tension in her novels. You know, the difference between what a woman like Jane Austen has to do with her duties and daily responsibilities versus what a woman like Elizabeth Bennet has to do. It's, it's a question that, in some sense, uh, doesn't come up or comes up in subtle, quiet ways that um, 
that can be probed, but that don't really cry out for attention. The, the one novel where she does take, I think, a closer and maybe more critical look at England's social system is her last work, Persuasion. And it's interesting to wonder what she might have done in Sanditon, but we really can't, we can't be too sure. But in Persuasion, you have a kind of dialogue between um, the landed gentry, as, as exemplified by uh, Sir Walter Elliot, who is a, a really kind of um, comical but sad failure of a baronet, and, uh, and, and the Navy, uh, and Austin was, loved the Navy and was very loyal to the Navy and very proud of her brothers who are naval officers. Uh, and there you have a sort of merit-based social system that, that in persuasion Austin seems to find very refreshing and, and positive. So I wouldn't say that social critique is absent from her work, but um, it's muted. And I, I certainly think that she, um, um, you know, she's not, she's not a thoroughgoing radical egalitarian. Uh, she knows that roles can be, while limiting, also um, very supportive of the relationships that we establish and the work that we do, if you like, in society. Hi. So you mentioned that Pride and Prejudice was originally titled First Impressions. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more on that. Why was the reason for the change in title and who did this? And then uh, why Pride and Prejudice versus First Impressions? Um, I think that her publisher, I'm, I'm not 100% sure on this, but I think that her publisher suggested the title Pride and Prejudice. And I think that was based on uh, kind of the style uh, it was doing well at the time. Austin herself does not seem to be a, have been a great writer of titles, and uh, her siblings changed the title she had in mind, and she drafted things with titles that, um, you know, she just used the name, the Elliots, Susan, and uh, Emma. Um, for why first impressions? Uh, I think because um, both Darcy and, and Elizabeth Bennet uh, are too reliant on their first impressions. And Austen was always very interested in um, in a society, and, and this builds a little bit on the last question, where um, mannered behavior was very important. And there was a kind of decorum and uh, structure to what you could say and do in society. Uh, it can be difficult to read between the lines, and uh, and, and first, imp you have to make a judgment based on what people say and do in society, and, and often two people who are going to be engaged to be married would never have been alone together. They would have seen each other entirely in, in social and socially controlled settings. Uh, so the... Um, the importance of looking past first impressions is, I think, what she's really driving at in that novel. We have time for one more question. Thank you for your time tonight, Dr. Murphy. Um, so from your discussion, it seems that Austin had a really special relationship with several members of her family, especially her sister. And just considering that there are several um, sister pairs and close female friendships in her books, can you just talk a little bit about how her uh, relationship with her sister might have impacted those relationships in the books? They were very, very close. Um, as I said, when Cassandra was away, Jane had to write. She had to put down her thoughts to Cassandra. You can see that in the comment her mother made when they were girls, uh, Jane's devotion to Cassandra. Um, I think the fact that they had both known the sadness of perhaps anticipating marriage, uh, certainly Cassandra had anticipated a marriage, and Jane, I think, had at least begun to do so, and, and, and uh, um, letting go of that uh, must have bound them closer together. And they would have anticipated, I mean, by the time uh, Jane died, I mean, they would have anticipated growing old together. Uh, and this was, as I say, it's, it's, a, it's a social world where uh, you know, the behavior at a card party or um, in a sitting room uh, or at a meal has a kind of script to it. And the number of people with whom you would share your unvarnished, from the heart, 
emotions and feelings and words would be, would be very few. And Cassandra was, I think, that person for Jane, and I'm sure Jane was that person for Cassandra. And sibling relationships in general are, um, are prized in her novels. And again, we tend to think of them as the novels about courtship and marriage, but um, they're really novels about societies and communities, and siblings are sort of our first society. Jane, Jane loved that. Please join me in thanking Dr. Murphy.